Hey y'all, welcome back to another APTA Live student night. My name is Yusra Ifjakar. I'm your Student Assembly Director of Communications and I use she, her pronouns. I know I say this every month, but I am very, very excited about tonight's topic. But before we get into that, take a second, introduce yourself in the comments if you're joining us live, tell us your name, where you're joining us from, and your program and year if you're a student. And if you're a PT or PTA with your own practice, go ahead and shout that out in the comments as well. Promote yourself, maybe let people know if you're hiring, if the students who are joining in tonight are looking for a job and you're okay with people in your area reaching out to you. All right, tonight we are talking all things entrepreneurship and starting your own practice. And I have got the perfect people here to talk about that with me. I wanna introduce you to physical therapists, Craig Pfeiffer and Ashley Johnson. Hey. Craig, <laughs> Ashley, welcome to the APTA Live. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having us. Sure. So we'll start with Ashley, then we'll go to Craig. If you don't mind just introducing yourselves, telling us about your respective practices, maybe the demographics of the patients you typically see, how you got started, and anything else you want us to know. All right. Well, hi, y'all. Um, I am a physical therapist, of course. I graduated from Hampton University in 2015. Um, after that, I actually went into a PhD program at University of South Florida, uh, be it that I don't know anyone that went to get a PhD. I didn't really know what that was. And I wanted to study volleyball and that wasn't being funded. So I didn't want to do military. And um, after that, I went in back into the volleyball world because I played college volleyball and I love to coach. Um, so I started coaching volleyball again and then realized that volleyball players need specific help for rehab and to train and what better than a volleyball player who's a physical therapist to do so. Um, so I came to Atlanta a year ago, immersed myself into the volleyball atmosphere at a club that's called Tsunami Volleyball Club. They have like 275 girls. My practice started as a mobile practice. I just set up a table in their gym. And because I had a history of being a good volleyball athlete and a coach, parents entrusted me. I started getting about eight treatments a night. And then I realized, I think I'm ready to start my own private practice. So I opened my brick and mortar up um, two months ago in Union City, which is 15 minutes south of Atlanta, and recently started dabbling in um, After Dark P PT, which has been uh, on Twitter. And we'll talk about that a little later. But yes, a new private practice owner and everything is cash based. I don't do insurance. And then um, on top of the cash base, I have an income based sliding scale because the city of the area of Atlanta I'm in, they're not high earners. So the normal cash prices of big, big box PT at like 250 a visit is astronomical and a deterrent. Um, and so I created an income based sliding scale to be more accessible to those that um, are in financial need, especially during times like uh, the COVID pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're gonna get into all of that more really soon. But Craig, tell the people who you are. All right, I am uh, the CEO and one of the owners of Rehabilitation and Performance Institute. Uh, we are a physical therapist owned company that started in 2016. Uh, we have grown to six offices, two in Illinois, two in Indiana, uh, two in Kentucky. Um, and as far as how we're, I almost look at our market as not as much patients, but therapists. So we're not a niche uh, practice. We're a practice of niche therapists. So we're a practice that I would say we, we hang our hat on our ability to help our therapists explore the patients that they want to work with and set them up for success with those groups. And now I'm at the office and the phone's ringing. That's really good. Uh, so hey, if it were like early going, like if we were like two months into starting our, our practice, I would have actually stopped and answered that phone call to get a patient. But um, we're four years in and we're doing a little bit better now. So I can I can let those things ring out. Uh, uh, on there for you. And uh, and just recently I started a company called Private Practice Rebellion, um, where I work with other physical therapists to start their own private practice. Awesome. Um, and that is, I mean, perfect segue into what we're talking about tonight. So can you talk to me a little bit more, Craig, about Private Practice Rebellion, how you got that started, and when you knew you were ready to uh, move from having started your own practice to now consulting others and helping them? Uh, it would probably around that time. And I think like Ashley's seeing a lot of this online right now too. And you just start getting a lot of people ask you, 
Like, how did you do that? How did you do that? Mm -hmm. um, and at a certain point, it's just like, I, you almost run out of time to have all those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Exactly. And you, you need to, to help the people who are, who are really serious about it and like help people explore it. So you do things like this. And I um, teach some courses in the local PT program um, to help people kind of explore interest in it. And ultimately, I think private practice is one of the better things that uh, PTs could do to advance not only their own career, but our profession entirely. Of you know, There's so many people I, I talk to that they get out there and they say, like, I, I just can't find the job that I want. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because you need to build the job you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And both of you started your practices fairly recently. I mean, in the last, you know, you said 2016, Craig, and then actually you've been giving us kind of you know, frequent updates on Twitter about how opening your practice is going. So how did you know that you were ready to take that leap? And did you have, I mean, any self-doubts you had to overcome? Anything that told you, okay, this is the right time? Um, for sure. So I am a second generation rehab. My mom's an occupational therapist. Um, and so I kind of knew going into my professional career, what to expect, like how it would look. Mm -hmm. um, and I never really fit that. Like I was never really comfortable uh, with the set 40 hour schedule. I get bored very fast. My environment needs to change. And, you know, when I went from working in an inpatient a year out of school to doing home health, and then I did ortho and I was like, I like ortho, but I'm, I get burnt out. Like I come home and I fall asleep mm -hmm. and I, the documentation kills me. And it's just like, I'm seeing 14, 16 patients a day, giving full energy, right? Giving all of myself manual skills and I'm exhausted. Um, and so basically it came to a point where I was just like, as a person, I wasn't happy with how my life was every day. I was like, I have something has to change. I love physical therapy. I love, you know, getting people better. I especially loved outpatient orthopedics. So I was like, I know I like this, but how do I conform this outpatient orthopedic specialty into what makes me happy? Because if you look across the job market, they're all the same. You're either working four 10 hour days or, you know, five days a week with your normal nine hour shift or what, what have you. Um, so my mom had me sit back and say, you know, what, are, what do you love? What makes you happy? Well, volleyball makes me happy and I love my career and I invested in my career of physical therapy. So how can I combine the two to make it profitable, help people and every, you know, it's a perfect symbiotic relationship. Um, and so I took the leap of faith to, you know, invest in myself, get get some equipment, get some marketing materials, really put an idea behind who I wanted to be as a physical therapist, um, solo practitioner, and uh, started a side hustle. So I knew I didn't want to leave my 40 hour a week job. We have student loans, we have bills to pay. Um, so I was working 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. at Ortho Atlanta. And then I was going into the volleyball gym from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., basically treating cash based pa patients. Um, and once I put myself there and it said who I was, and when injuries occurred, they came to me and they got back to the court faster. Yeah. Parents, parents didn't have to make appointments, leave work earlier, get them out of school early. They could come right to the volleyball gym, see Doc J, see if you're ready for the court. I knew how to create some type of um, uh, progression program for like your basic ankle injuries, uh, rotator cuff injuries and things of that sort. And because the pool of girls was so large in this volleyball gym, my referral pool was insane. So yeah. it it went from the athletes to the athletes' parents because they're in the gym three hours with watching their daughter practice. And then I would be at tournaments and then it'll be parents at the tournaments, other clubs. And next thing you know, I have a waiting list because people are trying to see me between the hours of 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. That's the only time I'm available. Um, needless to say, I was burnt out. 
yeah, doing it. And by the time that COVID came around, it interrupted the season. And that really gave me a time to take a step back and look what just hit me in the past, you know, seven to eight months. Mm -hmm. I was literally treating, you know, eight patients a night at $50, five to seven days a week. And that's profitable. And um, at that moment, that's when I took a very calculated risk of investing in a brick and mortar, allowing myself to be available for these people, you know, in the mornings and not at the big box PT clinic. So I, um, I basically did a year of in the volleyball gym and then literally an anniversary to that year was when I opened up my private practice uh, in August. Okay, all right, very nice. Craig, what about you? Uh, like Ashley talks about a, like a leap of faith, which is awesome. Like I more like got pushed down a flight of stairs. Uh, <laughs> actually, I got like fired, uh, literally. Oh, no. Um, no, yeah, I had, uh, our youngest son was 12 days old and I got fired. Um, no. Yeah, no, no joke. Oh, wow. Little story for like how that went down. But I was, I was running a, uh, a therapy group for like an orthopedic practice. Yeah. And that practice um, basically was like bought out by another practice. And like, you don't really merge cultures, like one culture kind of swallows the other. And like where we were at, we had a really awesome culture in place. And then uh, when the other group came in, like all the conversations changed, you started to have these conversations. And like, I, I like remember the day where I was just like, oh man, like I might need to start planning my exit. Um, I had a conversation with my boss and like talking about patient care and all that stuff. And she said, no, no, no. Like it is profits mm -hmm. is what we care about first and foremost. And then we take care of patients. <sighs> it's like, oh. like and that, like I, I have probably like had like three, like sleepless nights in my entire life. And that was one of them. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I, I can either change their mind or I can go do it on my own. And because I wasn't really, man enough, tough enough, whatever you want to put it as to go do it on my own right then. Um, like I tried to like change the culture from the inside and like what resulted in is I, I pushed a little too hard and I'm, I'm a little bit proud that I got fired. Um, Cause I, I, it obviously worked really well and, and incredibly happy with how it all turned out. But like to say that I even took a leap of faith, wow. like, I, didn't, I didn't even have that amount of courage. Like I got pushed and then it was just like, well, I got a 12 day old at home, I have other kids to feed. I got to do something. So let's, Let's roll with this. And I had a lot of the other PTs at the practice we were working at. We're all in on the same exact thing. And just like, no, we're, we believe in what we've been doing, that we're going to put patients first and that's the best way to make a profit. Right. And so the literally then we have my practice, we have nine owners. Um, and Ooh. we started four offices inside of six months. Wow. Um, and we were profitable as a company overall in our eighth month. So um, we went, we went big, I yeah. want debt, but went big. Sure. wow, there is so much that y'all said that I want to, I want to touch on, but I'm curious, Ashley, have you heard anything like that? The, the profit over patients kind of mentality? Um, for sure. And that's, you know, one of the biggest drives of my business model for my cash based physical therapy program. Um, I have just like that, no frills. You know, you can look on my website. The prices are what they are. It's two fifty for an eval and a hundred for a treatment session. However, based on I took the federal property guidelines and created my own scale, so that you know we say that we don't want to devalue PT in regards to discounting our services because we're worried about uh, interfering with the salaries of personal trainers who sometimes have large, especially when they get good clientele, it all, it closely matches. But one thing that I feel like we don't take into consideration is the equity of our skill. Um, a hundred dollars to one patient is, could be a thousand dollars to another one of my patients. When you're dealing with people who can't keep $500 in their bank accounts, asking for a $200 a week to help their knee, as much as they want it, they have to eat, they have to pay their rent. Um, and I'm therapy for the people. And that's one of my, you know, main things because as a therapist, my patients wouldn't come back and I'm like pretty cool. Like, <laughs> you see me, they're like, Doc J, I feel like, my patients, if I'm sick, they will literally call the office and be like, is she okay? 
does she need chicken noodle soup? That's amazing. Um, and so <laughs> when my patients wouldn't come back because I built that rapport with them, yeah. I kind of, I don't get offended, but I'm just like, bro, we were good. Like, where are you at? And the majority of time I call these people, they're stopped at the door. They have a bill with the surgeon. They can't meet their deductible. They want to see me, but they can't pay one seventy five dollars until their $7,500 deductible is met. Mm -hmm. um, and that hurt my heart because everyone deserves care. And I'm just trying to create a model where I can have high clientele mm -hmm. in order to treat this large population of people who can't afford to be seen by conventional physical therapy. Right, right. And so one of my questions for, for both of you is going to be, how do you take kind of your own passions and your own, um, almost like what you want to achieve just in your life outside of physical therapy and apply it to your practice? I feel like you've touched on it a little bit, but is there anything else y'all would want to add? Like for me personally, knowing mental wellness and social justice are my two biggest passions and knowing that if I were to open a practice in the future, those would be my priorities, figuring out how do I incorporate that into the physical therapy part of my practice. So was that something that you feel like you've done intentionally? Is that just kind of, that's your nature and that's how you started to run your practice? Is there anything you'd want to say on that? Either or both of you? Uh, I, I guess I'll hop in on that one. Sure. Um, so I've, I've always looked at it of like, you know, that we talk about like work-life balance. And I, I think like anytime you're searching for that, you're probably setting yourself up to be unhappy because those two things are like never perfectly balanced. Uh -oh. um, what what I really wanted to do is like blend my work life and my personal life together is the, the people I was hanging out with um, on the weekends were also the kind of people who trusted me enough to, to uh, be their physical therapist and like that I could, like my kids have gone to work meetings with me before and, and um, they'll like, I'm at one of our offices right now and this is a common play place for them. You know, they'll, they'll run around. There's some, there's some cool stuff in physical therapy. <laughs> <for them. laughs> so like, um, I, I think like once you do away with like, oh, I have to keep these things separate. Um, like once you find your, your people, mm -hmm. um, your, your, your target market, your community, however you want to say that. And you'd say like, I like being around those people. And it's awesome when I'm getting paid to do it. But man, if I wasn't getting paid, I would still want to be around those same people. Right, right, right. And just to piggyback off of Craig, you sell it so eloquently. But um, the thing, it's like us as physical therapists, we, we have to take ourselves out of that clinic box, right? Because we're normal people. Like how when we had our teachers and we would see them at the grocery store, we'd be like, Mrs. Vince, like, how dare you be at Walmart? Like, <laughs> you buy bananas too? What? Right. Your patients <laughs> have lives. And it's just like, and you have a life. So where do you like to be at? And physical therapy is such a beautiful science that everyone needs it. Yeah. Everyone needs it. We just have to have the ingenuity to find the need in that specific population. So it's like we have geriatric PT, pediatric PT, ortho, neuro, those are all specialties, but what about PT for gamers, mm. PT for skiers? Like there's a PT who has to love skiing, there's a PT who has to love going to their bowling league. Optimize your community and introduce our, what physical therapy is, because I feel like everyone knows what a Cairo is and no one knows what we do. Mm. Yeah, that's why. Right. <laughs> like, I'm either a Cairo <laughs> or a masseuse. Like, I'm like, no, I'm a PT. They're yeah. like, well, is it like a Cairo or more like a masseuse? Yeah, <laughs> you've both been pretty open, um, sharing either you know how you started your practice, that journey on social media, or just kind of your thoughts on private practice and how things should run in our in our uh, in our field. Have you ever, I'm curious, gotten a patient from social media? And how has that worked? <laughs> I'll, I'll take oh, Ashley's got to start on this one. Yeah. And then we talk social media. Just go straight to her. Um, <laughs> so like we are just, it's a perfect segue. Like we were talking about, where's your community at? Yeah. So I find myself um, in Atlanta. I love, this is a, a rich hip hop culture community. There's always stuff going on and I'm always there. And typically these are markets where there's just like multiple businesses, you know, selling soaps or something like that. But never do you see health 
Like, it's never like if you go to these, no one's checking blood pressures. No, you have to go to like a free health clinic to get that done. Ooh. So while they're twerking, why not check their blood pressure? <laughs> right. Everyone has low back pain. And the majority of people who go to these events are workers, laborers. They are essential workers. They're fast food restaurant, all of that. Yeah. They're out at night. And I'm out at night. So it's just like when I'm interacting with people, they're like, oh, you're so cool. And I started telling people I was a physical therapist. They're like, wait, I never met any physical therapist. And, and it's sad that that happens. But in our community, in my specific community as an African-American woman, there aren't many physical therapists. And so that created a, that created a lane and a light bulb went off. It's like, wow, they don't even... There's no one here to connect the highway to what is physical therapy. So let's go where I'm at anyway and see if PT will work. So I started doing like, you know, the night events, talking to those um, interviewers, DJs that have the mic and fix them. And then when I fix them, they go on their social media and they tell their their followers, hey, Doc J, she fixed my back, yada, yada, yada. And next thing you know, we have more people that are just, ne that never went to the doctor. I have some people that walk up to me and they're just like, hey, can you look at my arm? And I'm like, yeah, what's wrong? And literally cannot extend, like can't get full range of motion, but, hasn't went to the doctor just like oh I just ice it yeah. just, and that's so unfortunate but it was because they never had anyone in their face to just look at it for them right and so when you when you put yourself in these uh areas where you're these are your people and your people don't even know what value that you can have to, for them the trust is already there because like Craig said these are going to be your people with, with PT or without PT, you're going to be around these people anyway. Yeah. So when you create rapport within a community before you even say you're a PT. So if you go to church and you're like an affluent church member, you're in all the different church member groups, you just became the church's PT. <laughs> right. and there's, you know, and there, there's, there's something for that. Um, and so recently, like you guys have saw, I'm, on my Twitter. If you don't follow me, please follow me. It's at Doc J P T D O C J A Y P T. And um, I recently went on a thread about after dark PT, things that happen when you are treating entertainers of the night, bartenders, people that work from 10 a 10 PM to 4 AM. And then the place doesn't really close until 7 AM um, places that I honestly would have been sleep for even in my prime partying days, but everyone needs PT. And when you enter into a environment where it's heavily cash, where you don't, you're not dealing with hourly workers, you're dealing with people who have cash on hand all the time. Um, your value is easily off. Like they, they can pay it. They can pay it at that moment. And as soon as they realize how dope PT is, they're going to want it again and again. And so, um, I think I'm going to take this after dark PT thing as far as I could possibly take it. <laughs> um, and I think with that, it could bring awareness to physical therapy in itself because we live in a day and age where virality brings consciousness. Right. Like something has to go viral for our brains to pay attention to it. Right. So physical therapy on a platform, then maybe just maybe the current network and web of reaches that we're trying to get will just expound because now we're funny. Now we're cool. Now people want to go to PT. And yeah. that's basically what we need. And you would think that we would have planned this because I mean, I can't think of a more perfect example of that blend of personal life and, and business and work that, you know, Craig, you hit on that it might not be a perfect balance of the two, but the way that you can, if you can blend those two together, then you're sitting pretty well. Um, I want to go back to, uh, Ashley, you brought up the idea of like trust between um, yourself and the community. And that is kind of what has driven a lot of people becoming your patients rather than people coming in. And then that being kind of the first time you get that chance to establish trust. I'm sure that happens as well. Um, but Craig, I know that you are, are someone who um, 
holds therapeutic alliance in really high regard. And that's something that you really look to train your therapist on. So um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And how did you know that was going to be such an important predictor of success for your therapist and your patients? Uh, for us, it just came like knowing a little bit of what's happening in the profession is that only 30% of patients actually complete care. And that's like the highest number you'll find. Some places you'll find that only 10% of patients actually complete care. Yeah. And once you start there, you're just like, oh man, we've got, we've got a problem. We've got a massive problem. Right. And we're, we're nowhere near, like we're, we're arguing over all these things in the background of, of well, like, oh, you should have done this with this patient, this with this patient. And nobody's talking about like, oh, you should have listened to that patient a whole lot more right. and understood where they're coming from, what's going on with them. Right. And it's something that we all recognize is really important of uh, establishing trust with patients, interacting really well and listening really well. But when was the last time that we all like went to a continued education course on that or mm -hmm. that we uh, oh. if, it's, if it's so important, why are we not working to get better at it? You know, um, so it's one of the, the ways that I think as, as a company, we've set ourselves apart in that uh, it's it's in the things we measure. We, we measure our therapist's ability to to develop relationships with patients because it doesn't matter what you're trying to do, like always part of PT or how you're trying to do it. It's it, part of it is you're changing behaviors, right? Right. And right. You, you don't change behavior if people don't trust you. Right. So you have to establish trust with patients. Right. And it, you're, you're just not going to be if you don't do that. So for us, it was like, there's a massive problem in the profession. It's not working for patients. Right. To, to maybe 30% of them are actually completing care. And what happens to those 70 to 90% who don't complete care? They go look for other answers mm -hmm. and they go get their MRI and they go get their, uh, their surgery. Right. And that's where we found, what was the, it, it's recently published. It was, they found that uh, people who were higher utilizers of physical therapy had lower overall health care costs for low back pain. Oh, well, it's because yeah. people who don't, who drop out, they go, they're not like, oh, well, okay, well, I'm good enough. Like nobody's just like, you know what? 70% as good as I was before is going <laughs> to be okay. No, right. like we don't want that last 30%. And that's hard to get. Right. You don't get that without trust for people. So, so that was huge for us. Sure. And I think too, that really speaks to, um, I know you're both big proponents of newer grads. If we define that as like zero to five years out, starting their own practices mm -hmm. and um, I'm curious to know if either of you had a business background, but I think that also speaks to, well, you don't necessarily need it um, because a lot of what we do is truly that person to person connection. And any of us can work on that. We can do that while we're in school and even before we get into PT school. Right. Uh, I actually just taught a course on that about five minutes ago. So if anybody, oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> if, if anybody missed that, just go ahead and rewind it. That's like three college credits right there. Yeah, there That's you your know. marketing degree. Um, yeah, so, but no, so I, I just appreciate both of you touching on that because I think that the idea of starting my own practice, I mean, had you told me when I was a first or second year in PT school, I probably would have laughed and said, yeah, maybe in like 10, 15 years once I really have it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, um, Craig, we can start with you, then go to Ashley. Why is it that you're uh, so, so supportive of new, new grads or newer grads starting their own practices? And what sorts of things should we have in place, maybe know about ourselves? What logistical things should we have kind of down before we take that next step? Uh, if Like the reason why I think so many people should do it, like we all just heard what Ashley just said about like people she just reached who had no idea that physical therapy was gonna be a great answer for them. Imagine like a country full of physical therapists doing mm. that. Yeah. And right. like we, we talked about how Oh, the APTA isn't doing enough to spread the word about physical right, therapy. It doesn't come job. from that. That's not yeah. their job. They're a governing body. Like that's <laughs> not, we have to advocate for ourselves as physical therapists. We can't wait for a governing body to advance our profession. Like, I, I'm sorry. That happens that's, locally. People, people say like the, well, the APTA, well, like the NBA doesn't promote the NBA. You know what I'm saying? We watch the NBA because of the individual brands that we all love. We love LeBron. That's why we watch the NBA. Not because we like the NBA. Like, come on. Now. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's what like, that's why I'm such a big proponent of private practice is I think we'll, we'll actually do the good we can as a profession because clinically we have so much right. Like PT is one of the few 
healthcare. I'm not trying to knock any other healthcare professions, but I think we're doing a really great job of like getting to root causes and mm -hmm. doing it in a way that's financially sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, that I think that the more people who go to PT first, the the better our healthcare system is, the better our society is. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for it. Um, the other thing is like truly from a physical therapy owner standpoint, bad PT hurts us. Like somebody goes to PT is just like, no, like mm -hmm. why would I ever go to PT again? That's terrible. This is what physical therapy is. I get a, I ride a bike for 15 minutes. Nobody pays attention to me. Somebody yells exercises across the room. Uh, I get a hot pack and some e-stem and then I leave. Yes. And, and like, it's just like, ah, that's not what PT is. But once somebody's had it, like good luck convincing them, you know, right. it takes it's a lot harder. So like, I, I think for me as a business owner, it would even be much better. I'd rather compete with awesome. I would rather have an awesome physical therapist office right across the street right now um, than I would somebody go to and have that experience. Right. Um, right. right. And I think, again, that just speaks to you putting the patient first um, and that idea of therapeutic alliance. We had a really great question come in from Facebook, which was, um, could you give some examples of how you quantify a patient's trust or your therapist's ability to form those relationships and do it well? Um, when you can't really, when you say quantify, that's like you're, you're, that's science. You're putting a number on it, right? So I would have to change that, rephrase that question to how do you qualitatively assess the strength of your patient rapport, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, once you find, once you find your patient asking you questions about other aches and pains that they weren't sent to you for, mm -hmm. that's for me, that's a good indicator that this patient trusts me. When uh, you start, when they start um, vomiting information you, that you don't have to prompt them to, that's kind of, um, you know, about their nightly activities. You know, by visit, you know, my low back pain for uh, women. You know, at visit three or four, nightly activities typically comes up, and at that point, I'm like, okay my patient rapport is built. So mm -hmm. I can, I qualitatively assess my relationships with my patients by how much information they tell me without me prompting them. Sure. And then Craig, what about at RPI? Is there anything specific y'all do to assess that? That's exactly how I tell therapists to know, mm -hmm. like when you have somebody's trust, they start talking to you about things that aren't PT anymore. Right. <laughs> they, they start, they start telling you all these other stories. They want to, they want to show you the pictures of their kids. You know, they want to, yeah. they, they want to show you their dog. Like all that, that, that's how, you know, you have established great rapport with that person, the way we measure it. And I will be completely honest. Like it's an imperfect thing. Just like Ashley said, like, so the two most important measurements we have as a company, um, and, and I can essentially predict our success of each office with this, of uh, churn rate, which is basically patients dropping off, the percentage of people who drop off and when, mm -hmm. um, that like people like, it doesn't work for everybody, right? right? As great as we are, it's not 100%. And there's also people that have things going on in their life. It's never gonna be like 100% of your patients who start care, complete care. But you can do a whole lot better than 10 to 30%. Right. Um, I, I think you can get up in the 60, 70, 80% range. Um, and also we know about 30% of people drop off in the first three visits. So we can measure if your patients are dropping off, when they're dropping off, and based on when they're dropping off, what's the issue? So if you have a bunch of patients who are dropping off in visits one or two, you never gave yourself a, a time to establish trust with them. Right. And like it, it was, it came from a rapport issue. Like you weren't listening very well. You weren't considering their own suggestions for treatment. Um, right. You weren't, didn't feel like you were educating them appropriately. It's usually one of those big three things. Um, then if you get past that three visit mark and then like the next like phase of treatment is when we start to have enough trust with people where we can tear down some of those unhealthy uh, feelings about like, oh, well, I slept four hours last night and I think that's just fine. It's like, oh. right. Yeah. Like you can't have that discussion visit one and have somebody be like, yeah, I'm absolutely going to change that behavior. Right. But you get trust of them. So then like, and then after that, if somebody drops off without completing care, it's usually like, it's a clinical skills issue. They weren't getting better as quickly as they would have liked. So we can kind of quantify it in that. And then the other thing is exactly what Ashley just said. We measure how many patients call into our practice and say, I'm not calling to get physical therapy. I'm calling because Ashley is my physical therapist and I want to see her. Right. Like, 
And guess what? When you start the relationship at that very point, but that person trusts you before they ever walk in the door, right. like how much easier is your job as a physical therapist? Right. Literally. So then you create this wheel of people are more likely to finish care right at the very start, you know? Right. And now, your job is easier. Right. And that's, I was going to say, because we're talking about, you know, we, we have two different practices. I'm a solo. I am my brand. I'm myself. I'm by myself. Um, so our quantitative data for this is different because I'm the only practitioner and then I'm cash based. So the majority of my patients, because they don't have primary cares, I'm getting them better within that direct access time within, within that eight visits or 21 days. So when I sit down with them at visit one, I'm like, listen, we have this many visits to get you better. And that first visit, I give them, I make them fail. I always make my patients fail. Guys, make your patients fail. They shouldn't come to PT and be successful 100% of the time because they lose value in it. I, I have a specific exercise. I'll make them fail and say, listen, you'll be able to do this by Wednesday if you go home and you do this, 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 and this. That makes them do their home exercise program. It makes them want to come back and show me something. And so when it comes to completing care, I, I have a 100% rate because I'm by myself and cash base is different where they're coming to you because they can't go anywhere else. So the need to get better is a little higher, I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and to get better faster is a huge motivator for those financial reasons. So... Yeah. So many gems in there. So I'm going to let everyone just kind of process all of that because I know I just learned a ton in that like three minute segment. Uh, so we're going to take a quick uh, break. I'm going to go uh, to some announcements and then we will come back to this interview. All right. Got more announcements than usual. So bear with me, everyone. As always, the APTA blog is looking for writers. So if you have something you're passionate about and would like to write a blog post, email a draft or post idea to pulse at APTA.org. Uh, the Student Assembly Board of Directors is going to be sponsoring one PT or PTA student for the APTA Centennial Scholars Program, which is going to begin this coming July, or sorry, January in 2021. Oh, buddy. The application is available on Engage. Uh, my board member, Mitch, should be dropping that link in the comments for you now. The application is open and will close in a few weeks on Monday, October 19th. Uh, letters to CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is super important. We need thousands more letters to go to CMS, y'all, to fight the proposed cuts for our therapy services. Um, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's already put in the time to send in letters. Keep sending those in. Keep contacting your Congress people. It truly does make a difference, and there is definitely power in numbers. This Thursday, October 1st, there's going to be another Fight the Cut rally to encourage everyone to send letters to Medica Medicare. So keep an eye out on social media. Um, I know that APTA student members pages will be tweeting out uh, information um, to help you to do that if you're not sure where to start. Uh, the deadline to submit those comments is October 5th, so there is some time, so let's get those comments in. Um, all right, my favorite physical therapy conference, National Student Conclave, is going virtual, and we're going to have a little bit of everything. There will be on-demand sessions, live sessions, giveaways, and my favorite part, all students will have the chance to vote online for your next Student Assembly Board of Directors, including my position as Director of Communications. The only rule is you're not allowed to forget about me when I'm gone. Virtual NSC is happening November 4th through 8th. The link to register should be dropped in the comments very soon on Facebook. And you can also visit APTA.org for more information. Uh, not official APTA business, but I want to say a very big congratulations to our Student Assembly Vice President, Kayla Harris, on the birth of her new baby boy last night. I'm sending you and your family all the love, happiness, and health in the world, Kayla. All right, let's jump back into the interview. Um, Ashley, question for you. So um, you and I talked a little bit about this uh, before tonight, um, but me being a Pakistani Muslim woman, you mentioned you being an African-American woman. Can you talk about that a little bit? Have there been any additional hurdles that you either did or didn't expect as a Black woman in this space, whether that be leadership, business, starting your own practice, and how can other people kind of prepare themselves for those? Um, yes, no problem. I would say that um, my being an African American woman has definitely affected my experiences working, and those experiences drove me to be my own practitioner. 
Um, and I would say that, for instance, you know, when we're all new grads, I started an inpatient and an inpatient, the um, every different type of field wore a different color scrub. This is at every hospital, right? So you have like the PTs were in royal blue, the CNAs were in brown, the nurses were in light blue, respiratory therapists in black. You know, it's the hospital system. Sure. I can't tell you how many times I got, they thought I was a CNA and told me to go like clean a toilet or uh, someone at the room needed, you know what I'm saying, needed me. And it's just like- There's nothing wrong with that, but that just wasn't your role. There's nothing wrong, right, right, right. And it's just like, I don't understand why. And I would, you know, there's other new grads with me and I would ask them, Have these people ever ask you yada, yada, yada? And they're like, no. And it's just like, I feel like I always had, had to advocate for who I was. Right. Like I always had to say, oh, I'm a physical therapist, even if it was the color scrub that was supposed to match, the name tag said so, I still always had to make sure or announce who I was. Mm -hmm. um, then the types of relationships or personalities that um, I may have with my patients of color mm -hmm. that are innately different because of we don't have, we have shared experiences. Mm -hmm. So like, patients of color would be like, you know, you look like my granddaughter, like, and they would call me their granddaughter and things yeah. like that. And um, that's the part that I, I love because there's not many of us in physical therapy. Mm -hmm. and so it's like when I would walk into the room, their eyes would light up. They'll be like, I have you, you're my physical therapist. I'm like, yeah, I'm a physical therapist. <laughs> um, and you know, it was those moments where, you know, that light bulb goes off and it's just like, wow, my heart is full. You know, they love to see me. I would love to help them, but they were few far in between when I'm just treating, you know, normally, yeah. um, like in the, you know, normal demographic, it's not just like everyone. Um, but I would say that those experiences that warm my heart, I wanted to feel that way more, more than not feeling mm -hmm. that way. Um, and that's pretty much what drove me into Atlanta, um, into a space where I could, you know, show my face and say, hey, I am a physical therapist. We can have these interactions. And I feel like um, because there's a lack of us, when patients see that we're here, mm -hmm. therefore, Mac, it's it's more magnetizing to come and even just try it. Even if they're scared of doctors, I've had like five patients who haven't had a checkup in five or plus years. Yeah. We're talking people 45 plus. Right. So I'm doing vitals checks. Like they haven't, they haven't had anything. And it was just because somewhere in our culture, we have some type of block. Um, and that, you know, in my heart, I'm like, man, if there's a block, I have to do something about it because if if not who, if not me, then who type of right. situation. So yes, my experiences as a black woman going to Hampton University, which is a historically black college, who tells us that our community has all these pre-existing conditions, chronic conditions, and we need to health promote and get the word out. Right. So I have that in the back of my head. And then as a practitioner, I see that what they said in school was correct. Mm -hmm. So like having all this knowledge that we have as African-American physical therapists, what, how do we take that and help our community? And so my way of doing that was getting out of big box PT, putting myself somewhere where no big box PT will set up shop. When I tell you I'm the only physical therapist in a 15 mile radius of corporate physical therapy because they see no financial benefit because 70% of the population is uninsured. Mm -hmm. the other people who are insured don't have the money to pay the deduct to pay their deductibles or their co-pays. So it's not a viable business plan for them. Right. So it's like, yes, you throw all of that has, you know, driven to why I'm in Atlanta, why I'm in Southwest Atlanta, and why I have a cash based income based discount sliding scale. So all of that. Yeah. 
And that's so helpful for me to hear too, because I know I've personally been through periods of imposter syndrome and um, there were no other Muslims in my cohort that I knew of. I've never met anyone who looks like me in the field. And so feeling like, well, then is there space for me? So I love that you've kind of taken ownership of that and been like, okay, well, that's clearly why I'm needed. And also my patients need me coming from uh, a, a... not to blast Muslims or but, well, no, okay, but like, but I mean, culturally, like we don't go to physical therapy. Why right. do the physical therapists want to knowledge? Why don't Muslims go to physical therapy? Uh, there are so many reasons, but a lot of it, yeah. I mean, there, there's no, there's no one like them. Right. Like, right. And I bet if you put yourself in a um, Muslim community center, an event hall or something, and you just started showing your face. There's a name. Like, that you could change the percentage of Muslims that get PT. Because right. what I'm seeing that happens is the people that I affect, they talk. Yeah. And even even if they have family members in Tennessee, they're yeah. like, okay, I call my uncle. He keeps saying he can't feel his right foot. I'm like, thank you for having him go to the doctor. Yeah. And it's like everyone, we're in the age of like Google Med and YouTube Med. And yeah. you know, as our as that middle class separation increases, people are gonna start relying on these type of like virtual technologies because they don't have the finances to actually seek professional help specifically for them. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, that was fantastic. So um, I wanna stay on this topic a little bit of just like general hurdles that you may have overcome. I told Craig, I think last week that I'm very like obsessive about sharing my failures and all my mistakes. And so I kind of get into that or as my professors would call it, learning opportunities or areas for growth. So uh, Craig, I'll start with you, then go to Ashley. What are some uh, learning opportunities that you've had since the <laughs> practice that were either expected or unexpected that uh, you think the audience could learn from? Um, like as as an overarching theme, I would say like look at it just like you do treating a patient where like there's no like one recipe that this works for every person every time and that it's always it's like I tried this, I saw how it went and then I adjust it. Right. Like, that, it's the exact same thing in business. Um, and we're so good at it because we're doing it every day. If you just take and you apply those to business, like you're probably going to be great. Um, for yeah. me personally, uh, I lost a hundred thousand dollars once. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, I, I hired a billing company without really vetting them as well as I should have. Yeah. Uh, and like kind of told them like, all right, like, yeah, I just said, we started off like four clinics in six months. I was like, all right, we're going to grow really fast. So like, I need you to be able to scale with us. And mm-hmm. they're, I think they're just like, yeah, sure you are. And, uh, and, and then we did and they weren't ready to scale with us. So what we found out, and this is like a year later, found out when we moved to another billing company is when, when claims were getting rejected, they just left them alone. So like in PT, like, if you're doing a great job, 15 to 20% of your um, things that hit insurance get kicked back. And that's like, you're doing good. Um, so those 15, 20% of things that were getting kicked back to us for like a year, yeah. they just didn't do anything with. And like, we're in like startup mode. So everything is crazy. And right. like, we're, we're, everybody's just kind of hustling around. Everybody's doing everything. Um, and then we get to this additional billing company. And they're just like, Hey, you know, that you've got like all this money, like sitting here. And we're just like, well, how much? And they're just like, ah, it's like a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and they're, they're just like, what can we do about that? And they're just like, probably nothing. Oh, so, no. <laughs> so like, no matter like what mistakes you'll make, you probably won't lose a hundred thousand dollars. You know, so. <laughs> If yeah. you do nothing else from this APTA live, <laughs> in your heart, you might not lose 100000 starting out. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Ashley, can you do that? <laughs> um, I can't compete with that, but I mean, mine hurt my spirit just as hard as that. But anywho, so like I said, when I first started, I was mobile. The volleyball facility already had a gym workout area. So I literally put my table up in my sign, boom, Doc J's clinic. Like literally that's what I did. Um, and so when I went to look for a storefront facility that was in the community I wanted, I may or may not have rushingly signed the lease. Like, 
And that's something that, you know, that was just a beginner's, you know, shame on you, but it ended up costing me at least $8,000. Okay. Um, so the suite that I chose, basically whoever had it before just like didn't take care of it. And yeah. there was like moisture around the HVAC system. They like didn't do anything with it. So while the suite was basically for rent, that HVAC system just had water that kind of lined the walls. Long story short, we had to demo the entire suite. Yeah. And like rebuild it up entirely. And I was able to negotiate like, you know, rent off and stuff like that. But the time it took, you know, the contractors. And so it, it kind of was my moment of, you can't do everything, girl. Like you have to ask for help. Right. Um, if anyone hey. wants to, like get their brick and mortar, do it the right way. Get a realtor who knows the area, most properties, because, you know, it's just, especially with COVID, people were like leaving their, you know, rental spaces. And so these properties were trying to get people to sign really fast and giving sweet, sweet deals. But there's always a reason for that. So I would just say like, when it comes to the business side and logistics side, you don't want to start off in debt all the way. Just invest in the people who know it. Like I'm the PT, like I'm the expert in movement and all of that. And I should have handed, you know, finding a suite and all of that to a professional. Mm. That's so true of, of like, we want people to respect us and pay us for what we're so good at. Right. Like one of the ways to get comfortable as a PT uh, with asking people to say, hey, like my time, my, my expertise, my skill, like that's worth X amount, X amount an hour or whatever, right. is when you start paying other people for their time and expertise and you find out like, oh, my lawyer charges $300 an hour. Our accountant's like 200, you know? Yeah. Like people like, if you start paying those people and you realize, oh man, they still provided a ton of value. Right, um, right. That, you realize you as a PT can provide a ton of value. Right, that's true. At, at these at these rates that, that PTs yeah. are generally afraid to ask for. Yeah, very true. So I'm going to paraphrase a question that came off of Facebook um, because I think it relates here. So uh, Craig, I know I've heard you talk about on other podcasts um, that for like leadership development within RPI, there's like maybe a certain set of books that you encourage people to read, um, various resources that have helped you both out. So would you both mind mentioning maybe books, podcasts, other resources that students and new grads can start looking into uh, that might help them to anticipate some of some of what y'all just talked about. You wanna start, Ashley? No, you can start. Y'all yeah. okay. yeah, don't wanna hear what I have to say. <laughs> um, so like from a book standpoint, it's it's so much like PT school where it depends like where you are. Um, like if, if you're, the first thing everybody needs to know is like, understand and know yourself really well mm -hmm. because if you don't know like what you want and where you're going and where you want to be then like you'll you'll pick a path that is nowhere near the direction where you really want to end up you know yeah. so the first thing i would advise is like so um there's a book by mark manson the subtle art of not giving uh f uh -huh. i think it's a really good one for that <laughs> um so it sounds like it's a book about not caring about anything it, it's it's not that it's a book about not caring about the things that don't matter Mm -hmm. um, and when you don't care about the things that don't matter, it gives you room to find the things that do. Um, if you're somebody who struggles with any of the financial aspects, like uh, Ashley just said, like it is so important to be to be really smart about how you spend your money in the beginning, um, yeah. well, the entire time, but really in the beginning because there's not much of it, you know. Um, uh, Profit First is a good book. Um, it talks about how like the entire like financial equation of like profit, you know, revenue minus expense equals profit is how we generally look at it. Right. And why it's like, we just look at like profit is what's left over. Um, and it's why there's rarely anything left over is because it's just like the, it's just something that magically happens as opposed to if you look at it as like revenue minus profit equals expense of like, no, I was always going to keep profit. And the way I did that was I was only ever going to spend this much. Mm. Um, and you, you switch that financial equation is one I really like. And then uh, The Lean Startup is a really, really good book talking about basically applying the scientific method to your business. Okay, very nice. 
So I'm the opposite of Craig. Okay, let's hear. I'm, so I'm I'm kind of on the lines of, um, there's a lot a lot of times in the books that I read, it's something that like worked for them or a philosophy that like kind of made them successful. And I find myself a lot of the times reading those and I don't even fit that possibility because that it just, I'm just like, eh. So in regards to the things that I do or what I would suggest people do, it's just pure introspection. Like, Figure out who you are as a person. Are you a person that's a go-getter? Are you a person that kind of sits back and, and lets things happen? And once you figure out who you are and the people that, again, you connect to, mm -hmm. all of that will flow. But it comes down to just, like Craig said, once we figure out where the community is and who your people are, everything that that's in those books will naturally flow and you can definitely use that stuff for background like i use um different books for the financial models to say what you know what will work what doesn't work how people feel before but it's you you'll read a book on how to create an empire or how to manage the money, but there's no empire yet and you have no money. <laughs> like, like that all sounds so good, but it's just like, how do I even get, you know, you know, that for that first part? And I think that's like a big part of our profession because we're all nerds. We're all smart. Like <laughs> through PT school, like we're we're all smart individuals. And our comfort is the research. Our comfort is the text. And at some point we have to just like use that as a foundation of the other part of us that we have to kind of let loose to combine everything together. And I think once I stopped reading and writing about what I wanted to do and actually just started taking steps to put it together, it flowed better instead of me putting the text before the movement, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. I think it's like the first step is always like knowing yourself so, yeah, so well. Yeah, yeah, you have to. And then just like, like you've probably done all these things, like you've done all these like awesome, awesome business decisions where you've done so many things that are really, really cool. And like you probably didn't even have to think twice about it. It was just the right thing to do. Ex like, right. Because you know so much about who you are and what you want right. and, and, and what really drives you that like it's the right decision becomes automatic. Like you, like these people who are always like making the right decisions in crisis, like Ashley's that person because mm -hmm. knows herself so well. Mm, thank you. But yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love the support. And uh, yeah, there's nothing I can say in summary that's going to top any of that. So I'm just going to go the next question. I know we're coming close uh, to time. There are a couple more questions though, if it's okay, that yeah. I would like to squeeze in. Um, one thing that I know I've really been wondering about is if as a new grad within the next five years, I did want to start my own practice, but I still felt like I was in need oh of mentorship. Um, mm -hmm. so you. <laughs> yeah, the bathroom. It's fine. <laughs> She'll be fine. Okay. Well, in that case, I'll wrap up quick. But what can you say to new grads who want mentorship uh, in the clinic, but still would like to go and start a new practice? Is Are both of those things uh, viable together? Um, I would say yes, because while I was doing my side hustle, I was working full time, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then doing my side hustle at night. So if you want it and you and you want to grind for it, it's definitely there. The biggest thing that our generation has than the older generation did it is social media. We have TikTok. We have Instagram. We have people that have like, you know, the Instagram checks. And if you send them to your clinic or if you work on them for free and then have them tell their followers they worked on me, it'll, it's crazy at, at the reach, how people will fly in to see you if someone with a check mark said that they saw you. Right. And there's so many um, chiropractics and DOs on Instagram and things like this that have people literally fly in because of what they see on Instagram. I have patients, they're like, can you do this? And I'm like, bro, boom. He's like, oh, why don't you put that on Instagram? I want to tell you. <laughs> like, no, but we definitely have that. And I feel like as a new grad or even as a student, if you start building your brand, start building your social media base and you get your locale, you know where you want to practice and you just start 
you have three years to build your referral pool. And then when you get out, everyone's going to be like, you're out. And they're going to use you. And it's, it's just a totally different world that we live in. And I think we definitely need to take advantage of it. Awesome. Craig, anything to add? Uh, not much. No, I, I really agree with everything she said right there. Like, it's the perfect time to, like, kind of blend some online mentorship through social mm -hmm. media. Like, there's probably, like, a great practitioner in your area who I bet you could even go like and that's kind of tough with you know COVID and all that stuff. Yeah. But like you could actually like get in the office with somebody. Like I I, I bet, and I'm not trying to throw Ashley in the bus here. But like if somebody was just like reached out to her, she's like, hey, I'm coming through Atlanta. Next oh yeah. Week, can oh. I stop into your yeah, like yeah. that kind of stuff. Like if you want. I did that yesterday on Twitter. I tagged. I said, out of you and I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. So like like don't be afraid to reach out to those things. And then from like a starting your own business and positioning that like get to know those people. Like, what are they frustrated with in the healthcare system? Like, yeah. what are the challenges they're experiencing? Right. Because I promise you the other businesses that you're trying to compete against physical therapy, they don't know those things. They don't. And like you knowing those things is a massive, massive opportunity. And you can reach these people like Ashley's reaching who never thought physical therapy was an option for them. Right. So, so it's, there are so many opportunities available um, when you just get to know people. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we are pretty much past time. I do have one more question, though, for both of you that I like to ask all of my guests at the very end. If you could go back and offer your student self one piece of advice, what would you say? <laughs> um, I would say um, trust, trust in your knowledge, trust in your strength, and trust in your personality. Um, and I think if I would have just trusted in myself, you know, when we graduate, we have an intimidation and they say we have to get built up. And I think we have to find a time as new grads, build yourself up, become confident in yourself. And you'll see that once you start trusting in who you are as a practitioner, you'll become a better practitioner. And then other people will realize that. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I think I would tell myself something. So I think I'd say, like, put yourself out there more. Like right. get out there, meet a lot of people, um, get to understand a lot of a lot of what makes people tick, a lot of what drives people. Um, right. And even though I, I kind of lean toward the introverted side, um, that like forcing myself to get out there and do those things, um, I wish I had started doing that earlier. All right. And anything I haven't asked y'all about tonight that you'd like to any any parting words of wisdom you'd like to leave with the crowd. Um, I am going to start doing some consulting on cash-based physical therapy. My, my inboxes have been blowing up on Twitter. So you asked and you have received, um, you can go to my .jpt.com website and there's a consult tab and I'll start doing some consultations on how you can take basically, uh, find your niche. I'll teach you how to do that and basically start getting you rolling. Because we need to get out there. So let's Absolutely. do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would say um, uh, social media handles, Craig Pfeiffer on Twitter, Craig Pfeiffer PT on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, check out uh, privatepracticerebellion.com. All right. Well, Craig and Ashley, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. I know our guests have as well. Um, yeah. And and you already dropped your social media handles. Um, Ashley, you mentioned your website. Were there any social media handles or any email, anything else you wanted to drop? Oh, okay. yeah. oh, those, right? Come on. Hey, right. Come on, guys. Twitter, Instagram, DocJPT, D-O-C-J-A-Y-P-T, and DocJPT.com for the website. If you are not following her on Twitter, you're making a big mistake. Absolutely. A big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much again. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who joined in tonight. Check back on our social media pages uh, where we'll announce the October 2020 APTA Live Student Night. All right, everyone have a great night. Take care. Bye. Thanks,